Hello everybody. Um, I'm giving a talk today and the title of my talk is The God We Invent Is Not Who God Really Is. So that's the title but I'm going to actually start by talking a little bit about um, a holiday we had, we had on the Sydney Isles which led to further thoughts and then I'll develop the theme from there. Um, I've been to the Silly Hours several times actually and I went with Wendy some years ago to the Sillies to have a holiday, um, as I recollect it was uh, <coughs> on the main island. Um, and um, you'd find if you went to the Sillies today that it's a very wealthy place. Uh, the main industries are the flower industry and the tourism industry. Tourism of course is probably restricted today because of the, um, uh, the virus but normally there are crowds and crowds of people there every summer uh, and it's actually a lovely place to be but if you go back a century or two the cities were desperately poor. They had very little income indeed and one of the ways in which the poor people tried to cope uh, was pinching things off shipwrecks. Shipwrecks could offer a good deal of wealth and there were plenty of those around the city isles. In fact there still are. Um, many of the men on the cities today own Marks and Spencer shirts in quite considerable quantities and golfing bags and things which they took from a wreck of a ship which was sailing to Ireland a few years ago and it foundered on the rocks just off the edge of the, uh, of the Sillies. And I've learnt quite a bit more about shipwrecks and the wreckers from a book of that title, The Wreckers by Bella Bathurst. And in it I discovered that shipwrecks were often in the past seen as gifts from God, would you believe it? Um, in fact, um, the Priory of Tresco has a 12th century charter in which it says all wrecks should be enjoyed by the monks. And then I learnt of a vicar's prayer again in the city Isles, where he said, We pray thee hard. Not that wrecks should happen, but if they do, that thou wilt guide them to the silly hours for the benefit of the poor inhabitants. Then there was a parson in St Agnes who said, Brethren, before I open the service, I have a sad duty to perform. There has been a wreck. Instantly the church was empty, and he realised what he should do, and the next time there was a wreck, he made absolutely sure that he was the first person out of the church. The fact is that if you were very poor and you lived at the, um, on the coastline, uh, years ago, centuries ago, um, then a lot of your income and living might be based on plunder from shipwrecks. It was one of the perks of living by the seaside and some people could only survive by that way. Um, there was an extreme view that went around that shipwrecks were actually God's will. And some people said that it was wrong to rescue people from shipwrecks, and especially if it was on the Sabbath day. You shouldn't do that because it was interfering with God's will. Now this brings me to the main point of my talk really which I want you to think about uh, and that is that these people were inventing characteristics of God, uh, inventing a God who suited them really in a sense uh, and that is a very dangerous thing to do. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 it says and God made man in his own image. The danger is that we all too easily do the very opposite and that we make God in our image we imagine characteristics of, for, for God himself, uh, we imagine what he's like, uh, and one of the phrases that people often use is, I like to think of God as, and uh, different people have different endings to that statement, I like to think of God as a kindly man who will do me good. I like to think of God as somebody who will let everybody into heaven because he's loving, isn't he? Or other people have the opposite view, I, like, I think of God as, as cruel and harsh. Some people think of God as weak or, or absent and not having anything to do with human affairs. And all of these are, are inventions really where, where we build up an image of God of our own making. Um, but what we should be doing, I think, is thinking of the God of the Bible, the God who uh, is described in his own revelation to us. Do we think of God as powerful, as almighty? Do we recognise God as one who loves us? Um, do I think of God as a good father to me? Now I'm going to come back to this thought shortly. I'm going to um, talk a little bit now about lighthouses um, because uh, they follow on from the shipwreckers. Uh, but keep the thought in mind about inventing God as we want him to be rather than thinking about God as he really is. Although shipwrecks were a bonus for poor coastal villagers, um, they were bad for trade, bad for passengers, 
bad for profits and it's not surprising therefore uh, that lighthouses began to be and built. The building of lighthouses to warn ships of rocks caused a massive decrease in shipwrecks, particularly from I suppose about the 1750s onwards into the early uh, 19th, 19th century. And I'm fascinated by lighthouses. I always have been and I've visited quite a number of them in my time. All of them are amazing structures. They're built nowadays or have been for a long time actually, built with interlocking stones. I think it was Smeaton uh, who built the lighthouse which now stands on Plymouth Hoe but was once the Eddystone Lighthouse. Uh, he built his with interlocking stones and uh, lighthouses ever since have been built that way so they can withstand the most violent of weather. I've had the privilege of making two visits to Bishop Rock Lighthouse which is uh, 12 miles off the coast of the Scilly Isles. Um, I went in 1966 when it was still manned um, that was very exciting uh, and then again uh, with Wendy in 2002 I went to visit Bishop Rock again. Um, by this time it had got a helipad on the roof and was unmanned but uh, still standing there, still doing its job. One of the lighthouses which I have not visited but which is of particular interest to me um, is uh, one which raises the same question that I've already raised of the way in which we think of God. And this particular lighthouse is up in Scotland. It was brought to my attention by reading a book uh, called um, The Lighthouse Stevensons by Bella Bathurst. And uh, she writes in that book about the building of a lighthouse called Skerivore, which lies on a windswept rock 12 miles west of the island of Tyree in the Inner Hebrides. It's a particularly big lighthouse. It was extremely difficult to build and yet it was essential that it should be built. Constructed by Alan Stevenson, who was the uncle of Robert Louis Stevenson, um, the Stevenson family went on to build lots of other lighthouses as well. So I'm going to read an extract from her book about this particular lighthouse. So I'm going to read now. Often the weather could change suddenly with an ominous lull, a spatter of rain, and then a wind strong enough to lift a grown man bodily off the rock. Alan and the workmen often found themselves bolting for the boats, leaving tools, materials and provisions scattered where they lay. Small wonder that when they returned to the dubious safety of the boat and the long journey home every evening, most of the men could be heard mumbling prayers. Alan noted in his diary that isolation from the world in a situation of common danger produces amongst men, uh, amongst most men, a freer interchange of the feelings of dependence on the Almighty than is common in the more chilly course of ordinary life. Bad weather repeatedly held up progress, but work on Skerigor began again in April 1841, and for the first time the men were able to abandon the lighthouse boat for a barracks building on the rock which had been constructed the previous autumn. And when a storm started, Alan and the men endured a comfortless few days trapped in the barracks, waiting and watching. Since the rooms couldn't be heated, they spent most of their time in bed, listening to the howling of the winds and the beating of the waves, which occasionally made the house tremble in a startling manner. Alan noted in his diary that such a scene, with the ruins of the former barracks, not twenty yards from us, was calculated only to inspire the most desponding anticipations, and I will remember the undefined sense of dread that flashed across my mind on being awakened one night by a heavy sea which struck the barrack and made my cot or hammock swing inwards from the wall and was immediately followed by a cry of terror from the men in the apartment above me, most of whom, startled by the sound of the tremor, immediately sprang from their berths to the floor, impressed with the idea that the whole fabric had been washed into the sea. Ultimately, God and poetry remained Alan's only consolations. He was a deeply religious man and had always been devout, but in his retirement he became almost maddened by his own guilt. He suffered in old age from a growing paralysis. God, it seemed to Alan, was punishing him through suffering, and he saw his paralysis not as a random tragedy, but as God's retribution for past sins. Every time the pains lifted, he had moved a little way to paying his penance, and every time they came back, God was punishing him. He became tortured both in mind and body. Gradually he lost his ability to see himself as anything other than a sinner, eternally punished. At one stage he went through an agony of conscience over his insistence that the Skerivore men should work on the Sabbath, 
In 1854, a decade after the light was completed, he wrote to each one of them, apologising. Stevenson was a deeply religious man, but he had been brought up in a tradition which looked at God in quite the wrong way. And I think it's tragic that he did not see God as he, as he really is. Stevenson felt so guilty that he had broken the Sabbath, and yet he forgot that in the Bible we read of Jesus breaking the Sabbath too. And why did Jesus break the Sabbath? Jesus did so because he was healing people on the Sabbath day, much cr criticised for it, but nevertheless that's what Jesus did. And what better example could Stevenson have been than to build a lighthouse as quickly as he possibly could, uh, having things um, proceeding seven days a week in order to get the lighthouse completed early, in order that lives might be saved. A really good thing, I believe. So the sooner it was completed, the better. So the God of Stevenson's tortured imagination was not God as we really should know him, God of love. God who is really somebody who is concerned for individual people and their lives. And Stevenson's old age was spoilt by a wrong belief in the wrong sort of God. So far I've given you a couple of examples of people who had the wrong idea about God. The wreckers. The wreckers who were... Um, actually believed that God approved of shipwrecks and God approved of their self-centred actions in what they did in order to retrieve wreckage uh, and plunder from the ships and even to cause the death of people who could otherwise have been rescued. Then there was the second example of Alan Stevenson, the lighthouse builder, who, though a deeply religious man, had the wrong idea about God and thought that God vindictively wanted to punish him for his sin in having the lighthouse built seven days a week uh, in order that the completion of it should be hurried along. He had forgotten that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. Jesus was active on the Sabbath doing good and in fact what uh, Stevenson had been doing was good too. I'm going to have a third example now which goes completely away from um, seafaring and ships and lighthouses and things like that. Uh, this is from the world of art. In the Academy of Fine Arts in Venice there is a painting, a large painting by Veronese and it's entitled A Banquet in the House of Levi. It's a story from the Bible that he's portraying but his painting includes all sorts of things which were disapproved of by the Inquisition. A large crowd of people uh, are in the painting, and it's quite a humorous painting in many ways. It shows a man with a bloody, no bloody nose, it shows stray dogs, it shows drunks, it shows midgets and blackamoors and a jester. Um, and uh, Ver Veronese had developed a unique line in large scale, in fact preposterously huge and lavishly detailed altar paintings of biblical scenes like this, in which Christ sits down to a meal. It doesn't seem to matter to Veronese which meal he's portraying, but what he loves uh, is the opportunity to show a diverse crowd of diners, waiters and entertainers enjoying a banquet. In reality, uh, he is portraying the high life of Venice, the city where he lived. The Inquisition did not like it. He was called in by them and they were appalled by the inclusion of all this low life uh, and all this humour in the picture because they felt it was irreverent to uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't help feeling that the Inquisition were rather like the Pharisees of Jesus' time, who also didn't approve of the company he kept. Jesus was not their idea of what God should be like. The Inquisition actually made very easy change the title of his painting to something non-religious, because they felt that it was um, insulting uh, to uh, Jesus Christ, the way he'd done it. I'd like to sum up now by saying that we must not invent a God of our own imagination. We must not try to decide for ourselves what God is like, but look to the Bible to find out the truth about who God is and what He really is like. We've seen how the wreckers thought that God approved of death at sea, and they thought that he approved of the pillaging of shipwrecks. Then we looked at Alan Stevenson, who thought that God was invictive and cruel, and out to punish Sabbath-breaking. Even if, even if the work that he had done had saved lives. Then we looked at that painting and uh, learned that the Inquisition thought that it was irreverent and heretical to show Jesus associating with sinners and ne'er-do-wells. But when we look to the Bible we find a different picture altogether. We find that Jesus, the Son of God, came for sinners like you and like me.
Jesus talked about the person who said, thank you God that I'm not like those sinners over there, and contrasted him unfavourably with the sinner who came and said, Lord have mercy upon me, a sinner. We're reminded in the Bible that, that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than there is over 99 people who are not sinners and don't need repentance. And so our challenge is to commit ourselves to the Lord, not just to believe in him, but to become his servants. And then when we've done that, we need to try and clothe ourselves in his characteristics to become increasingly Christ-like if we can. And we can only do that if we learn about what Christ-likeness is by reading about Jesus Christ in the Bible and learning from that. And then thirdly, we need to uh, beckon others to come in the same direction. Maybe, in conclusion, I could say that the lighthouse imagery might still help us. When we think of those lighthouses, Scary Hall, Bishop Rock and all the other lighthouses, still shining, mostly one and a half centuries after they were built, guiding their ships, uh, guiding ships and their crews and passengers to safety and away from the rocks. That's in effect your job and mine too.